presentation, which is also uh, jointly produced anyway, but a little bit individually presented. Yes, yeah. And do you need any help setting up authentic? No, no, I don't have a handout. I don't have anything to write on the board. I just have my computer. So I hope you find that. Okay. Uh, and Are you projecting? No, no just read it. Just me. Well, can I introduce you? Yes, please yes. go ahead. Uh, from, uh, you're Avia. Yes. Okay, Avia uh, Patsock and Emily McTurn. Is Emily here? No, no she's okay. not here. Okay. And uh, the uh, title of the presentation is Rioting and Civil Disobedience A Collective Action Analysis. Yep. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And as indeed the chair said, my co author Emily McTurn is not here. I think it is traditional in this situation to say that any questions I can't answer, I will basically blame my co author. But I'll try not to do that. Um, so uh, the paper, um, and uh, just an apology from the start that I didn't, we did not pre-distribute the paper, but if anybody wants a copy of the paper, then please just email me and I'll send you a copy. I'll be very, very happy for comments on the written version. So uh, the paper we try to provide a moral assessment of a phenomenon that is becoming incre increasingly familiar in many modern liberal democracies, and that is a phenomenon of political rioting. And we define political writing in a very specific way. Political writing for us is a public, collective engagement in illegal violence in response to severe and persistent injustice, usually, for example, a systematic, systematic exclusion or discrimination of some, some minority group. And paradigmatic examples of political writing are um, what is dubbed the race riot that happened throughout the US in the early and late 1960s, more recently, we've seen a riot in the US in response to disproportionate police brutality against African Americans. Perhaps another example, we're still not sure about that, but perhaps another example is what uh, is called the London riots of 2011, especially in their earlier phases, which were, as you might recall, were again in response to police brutality. Now, as you probably know, rioting in of itself, and political rioting included in that, is a legal offense a separate legal offence in the law. And furthermore, and more interesting for us, we think that the popular position, especially in the, certainly in the media, and we think commonly held position, is that rioting is morally wrong. It's morally wrong, especially in light of the violent elements that rioting consist of, violence against public and private property, violence against private and public individuals. Now what we try to do in the paper is to argue against this common opinion and to develop, let me say from the outset, a qualified defense of a political writing. And we focus on a moral defense of a political writing. We don't have much to say about the legal implications of that. That may be something for a future project. We really just want to consider moral responses to writing. And the argument we develop in the paper rests on what we think are certain uh, conceptual uh, conce connections and affinities between uh, political writing and civil disobedience. Now, civil disobedience, as I'm sure you all know, uh, we commonly define it as public conscientious illegal activity in response to injustice. And civil disobedient actors perform actions that can be quite similar to typical criminal activities. So, for example, breaking into public buildings or destroying property, stealing electronic information, and other examples. However, we do find a common view in the literature that civil disobedience can be morally defensible and can even be morally praiseworthy. And generally speaking, the arguments in favor of civil disobedience argue that in contrast with common criminals, the civil disobedient actor is acting for the right reasons, and for that reason, her actions can be defensible. Now, there are several right reasons you can find in the literature on civil disobedience. The ones we are focusing on are the, what we call the functional reasons or functional defenses of civil disobedience. And the idea here is that civil disobedience is morally permissible because it improves the quality of democratic political communities. So one line of arguments by people like Markovich and Smith, they point to the way in which civil disobedience contributes to democracy by improving deliberative and republican qualities of the democratic process. Other, perhaps more famously, focus on the contribution of civil disobedience to justice. So civil, civil disobedience communicates to the political community the severity of the injustice it commits and corrects, helps the community correct the sense of justice when it goes astray. So going back to writing, we take it that on that common perception that I mentioned, political writers actually are not acting on the, for the right reasons or not acting with the right attitudes. 
So, for example, if you compare them to civil disobedient actors, it's not clear that the rioters are acting on sincere and serious moral convictions or that their actions express respect, uh, respect for and recognition of the authority of the law or that they're seeking to engage in respect of communi communicative conversation with their fellow citizens or that the actions are the product of some careful, considered moral deliberation of the consequences of what they're doing. And this is usually the way that we typically see uh, civil disobedient actors. Now, we don't aim to deny that there are important differences between political writers and uh, civil disobedience uh, actors in uh, paradigmatic cases. But we do suggest that there are two types of right reasons that can feed into the actions of, uh, it, it, sorry, feed into the moral assessment of writers. The first of these reasons involve uh, the relationship that can be created between political writers and civil disobedient actors. And the second uh, reason concerns uh, in the independent contribution that political writing can have for democratic political communities. So I will present these two arguments now, and then I will, I will say something about collective intentionality in writing, and hopefully conclude with some reflections on violence with relation to uh, political writing. Okay, so let me first uh, quickly uh, present the first argument that concerns the affinity between civil disobedience and political writing. And the starting point in here is the observation that paradigm paradigmatic cases of civil disobedience are often exercised as part of large protest movements that are made up of a wide range of participants. Now let us suppose, this is a contingent, but let us suppose, as Michael Waltz tells us to suppose in, in an early uh, paper on civil disobedience, Suppose that civil disobedience actually requires that type of collective context. And suppose, for example, that civil disobedient actors would not be able to perform their actions without some support from their fellow protesters. Suppose further that they need to know that there are people who are really enraged by the injustice, enraged even to the extent that they are willing to go and clash with the police as a result of the injustice. Maybe even these civil disobedient actions take it to be their obligations to such actor to take part in civil disobedience. So we think that under such circumstances, the, what we call the positive moral character of civil disobedience, if, if you accept it, then that can have spillover effects on other participants of the protest movement, including even political writers. Now here there are two possible set, senses in which political writers and civil disobedient actors' kind of respective activities can influence each other. The first sense is the sense that we reject, and this is a sense that you can find in the work of uh, Christopher Kutz, or at least I think it, it implies in, in, implied in the work of, of Christopher Kutz. I'll go quickly over it because we reject it, but it's more detailed in the paper. Uh, so if you remember, Kutz revolves his analysis of complicity around the idea of inclusive authorship. So he says that when actors intend to act together, they become the inclusive authors of their joint activity, and they are morally accountable for their joint activity. Now, we think that Kutz overly stretches the concept of inclusive authorships in the book because he argues that people can become the inclusive authors of activity they have no knowledge of and therefore can form no participatory intention to take part in. And we think uh, that this um, basically stretches the, the idea of inclusive authorship uh, too much and we should uh, restrict the idea of inclusive authorship only to participatory, overlapping participatory intention. However, the other and more direct sense in which we think that civil disobedience and writers can be connected is just through foreseeable contribution. So if you look at the literature on complicity, um, it basically, the common intuition there, whatever account you have, is that by contributing to the execution of wrongdoing of others, we become complicit in that wrongdoing and therefore blameworthy for our contribution to that wrongdoing. And the literature, on, the literature on complicity is kind of fixated with contribution to wrongdoing um, of others. But conceptually, I don't think there's anything that prevents us from identifying agents as complicit, complicit in a morally virtuous sense. So if agents should be chastised for contributing or taking the risk that they would be contributing to the wrongdoing of others, then they should probably be praised or at least praised to some extent for contributing or taking the risk that they will be contributing, or the chance that they will be contributing to the virtuous activities of others. So what does all this tell us about civil disobedience and writing? If it is the case that civil disobedient actors are encouraged in some sense by political writing, and if the writers are aware of that fact, then we think they can be regarded, morally speaking, 
as essentially contributing or potentially essentially contributing to the acts of civil disobedience. This is a framework of causality that Good and Aleppo are used and that uh, we use in the paper. And again, as I said earlier, if we take civil disobedience to be a form of political protest that is essential for democratic politics, and to the extent that civil disobedience actions are morally virtuous in themselves, this can have sp spillover effect over, uh, for the um, uh, moral assessment of the agents that contribute to the execution of their actions. Okay, so that was the first kind of line of argument you can say that should change your assessment of political writing. And now I want to move on to the second defense, which is actually more central in the paper, because there is an obvious problem with the contribution defense I just outlined, that this is basically contingent on the case that a political writing somehow contributes to a civil disobedience. And that doesn't have to be the case. So we might have a, a protest movements uh, that oh, we might have political writing that does not have a part of civil disobedience in it, as we now have in the US, and we can also have intern, internal tension within, within a, a political protest movement so that those who are engaged in civil disobedience are actually in disagreement with those who are engaged in political writing. And you can think about kind of the debate within the civil rights movement in the 60s in the US, and you might think, well, this is actually more fitting, uh, that scenario. So in the paper, we suggest that even where we can't see any contribution to civil disobedience per se, political writing can be morally indispensable, and for the same reasons that civil disobedience is justified. And I mentioned earlier several right reasons, if you recall, that justify engagement in illegal and sometimes violent protest activity, and two of these were related to the function that civil disobedience serves in democratic political communities, the justice function and the democracy function. And we want to suggest that sometimes, in the face of severe and persistent injustice, protesters could be justified in thinking that engaging in political writing is a useful mean for promoting exactly the very same goals. So think first about the justice function. So I think it is the case that paradigmatic case of riots have led democratic publics to engage with the extent of injustice they do in their communities. So take the example of the 1960s ghetto riots. Uh, for example, the Watts ghetto riots, especially in the early stages, the 1963-1964 wave of riots, they have produced the very famous Kerner report that was commissioned by uh, the Johnson administration, and that report not only recognized that the cause of the riots is uh, economic and social deprivation of uh, uh, blacks in the ghettos, but also recommended tackling that deprivation by moving resources to deal specifically with deprivation, and the recommendations of that report were, 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 were followed to some extent. More recently, you, th you can think about the riots in Ferguson and elsewhere in the US as communicating the extent of police brutality against African-American civilians, and those in Baltimore uh, seem to have contributed to the unusual decision to prosecute those, the police involved in the death of Freddie Gray. So that was the relation to the justice function. The riots can also be seen as a form of democratic participation. So we think that riots can enhance the republican and deliberative qualities of democratic debate by surfacing issues and concerns that have been excluded for some reason, for whatever reasons, from that debate. And even more straightforwardly, you can say that riots can be seen as a form of direct participation in the public sphere. So rioting gets media attention, it allows people who are usually excluded from the political conversation to take part in it, so suddenly people who uh, account for very little uh, at, uh, beforehand are given prominent place in the news, they're giving a stage to air their concern, they're giving a stage to be present in the public sphere, and that enhances the democracy quality. But of course, in order to defend political writing on these instrumental grounds, we also need to show that political writing serves justice and democracy better than other less problematic forms of protest. So why can't the socially excluded engage in legal protest or in civil disobedience in order to communicate the injustice that is done to them? So our response to this question is that under some circumstances, violent protest is actually the most appropriate response to injustice. And that is because political riots communicate a very specific moral response, moral response that is not communicated by these other forms of protest. So it communicates anger, it communicates resentment, it communicates outrage of the way that one is being treated by one's political community. And it also communicates impatience with that injustice. The minority that expresses its anger through violence communicates to the majority just how deep the resentment goes, and to what brings it being brought by that injustice, 
and how urgently the community needs to respond to that, uh, to that um, uh, resentment. Um, and I think the political writing also communicates to the, to the community at large that the state is actually losing its democratic authority, that the extent to which its law deserves respect is put into question, that the minority is no longer willing to play the game and obey the law when the law does not show respect to the minority. And I think that civil disobedience, with the emphasis on restraint, on conviction, on dialogue, it doesn't quite communicate that message. I don't think we can think of other forms of political protests that communicate that message. And arguably, in the face of systematic exclusion, it is precisely that message that is needed, to, uh, that is needed in order to generate change, or in order to generate a change quickly enough. Okay, now I want to highlight that our more defensive political writing requires not only that the actions in question uh, could bring about those desirable consequences, but those, or also that those who perform the actions <coughs> do that, that with the relevant intentions. So it's important to emphasize that in our account, political writing could be more defensible even if it doesn't, as a matter of fact, end up serving the goals it was intended to serve, as long as it was reasonable at some level to believe that it could serve them. And our focus on intentions also explains why, why we do not defend any type of collective or aggregate, uh, so any type of aggregate behavior that serves justice or democracy. So think, for example, of a wave of common crime. So suppose that the fact that young black people are convicted uh, of more crimes than average, or that they join gangs, that too can show us that, that we have a case of a disadvantaged community that is facing injustice. And so in that respect, one might say a wave of ordinary crime could also serve a valuable role in a democratic community. So do we want to, to defend violent crime? No, we don't want to do that. We don't think that it follows that the actions of criminals become morally praiseworthy in the aggregate. Because a crime wave is not actually a collective activity. The perpetrators of crime are not coordinated with each other, they do not share participatory intentions, and certainly they don't share the intention to communicate the extent of injustice um, that's done to them or, or, or feelings of deep anger and resentment as a result. That their aggregate behavior happens to indicate an underlying problem certainly gives us reason to respond to that problem, gives us reason to change our behavior, but it doesn't need to change our moral assessment of the criminal uh, behavior, at least not uh, in, our, in light of the reasons that we provide uh, in the paper. The picture is potentially more complex when we deal with groups that do, that do share some participatory intentions, but not the, the intentions to improve uh, democratic parties or justice. So think of a group of writers who do coordinate their activities, but their shared intentions are not those of expensing anger, but say just self-interest. I don't know, for example, personal gain from looting. We saw that in the in the London riot in the later stage, uh, stages. Is it possible to say in such cases that the group intends to communicate injustice, but the specific writers do not? So we know from the literature that, um, on, on a, co a corporate agency, <coughs> for example, from the, from the work uh, of, of Philip and Christian List, that there are cer cer certain circumstances where groups can indeed, can indeed develop intentions that are separate from the intentions of their members. However, standardly, these accounts are restricted to structural groups, so formal decision-making procedures. And it is that formal decision structure that is actually able to create that space where individuals' intentions are separated from uh, the intentions of the group. Uh, but crowds of writers do not have formal decision structures, they therefore don't seem to fall under these descriptions. In such non-structural groups, we suggest what we call the group's collective intention must be identical to the overlapping content of the members' participatory intentions. Now, there are some voices in the literature that resist that, kind of the push against uh, this, this conclusion. So uh, I'm thinking here about the work of Larry May, for example, that does ref it does, uh, refers to kind of um, a, a group intention that seems to exist independently of, indiv of, individ of individuals, even in crowds and mobs. He talks about kind of the pre-reflective collective consciousness of the mob that motivates people to behave, even they're actually not aware of the fact that that's what motivates them to behave. Uh, Paul Sheehy also has an argument where he suggests that it is possible for non-structured groups to have an attitude, for example, a racist attitude, that none of the members collectively uh, share through the group's uh, practices, for example. But we are not persuaded by this account. So if you look, for example, at racism, 
Um, we don't think that it's the case and individual members need to consciously endorse racism in order for them to, their individually to count as racist in some sense. If they share in practices that entail racist beliefs, they are basically being covertly racist. And when the group members share a covertly racist attitude, we think all we can say about the group that it is covertly racist, not that it is racist in a different sense than the group members. So there is no sense in which the group shares an attitude or intentions that the members do not. So just to conclude this point, we suggest that the group of rioters' actions are morally defensible only if the members harbour a participatory intention to improve democratic uh, politics and democratic justice although in a different sense than the civil disobedient actors, and the violent expression, anger and resentment are performed in light of these right intentions. Rioters who do not hold these participatory intentions do not qualify as political rioters in our analysis and are not uh, relevant for the groups that uh, fall on, on outside the group that we are analysing. Okay, I have five uh, minutes left, so I can have some time to talk about limits to violence. So, obviously, an obvious worry at this point is that our functional defense of political writing translates into some kind of unqualified defense of violent disobedience to the law. But that is not our intention. So, I already said one important qualification on, uh, on what we think is justified violence is that it must be political. Uh, it must be performed in response to discrimination, socially ex uh, exclusion, that are severe enough that deep anger and resentment are indeed an appropriate moral response. But even with that qualification, there is a question about the level of violence that may be permissible in the course of political writing. Now, the use of violence as part of political uh, protest, which is essential to political writing, is problematic for two reasons. First, instrumentally, violence might undermine the goals uh, that the protest uh, is set to serve. And we all, I will be kind of address that concern by pointing out that political writing is justified when we have reason, reason to think that the violence is indeed an appropriate mean to communicate a very specific and necessary message to the political community. But the other and probably more worrying concern with violence is uh, intrinsic. So violence against life, against safety, against property is rights violating. And of course sometimes we may violate other people's rights by responding violently to them, for example when they threaten to violate our rights, but using violence in order to communicate anger to the political community, you might see it as problematic because it entails using those others as means to an end, kind of disrespecting their status as human beings. Okay, so even with those concerns with mine, uh, with mine, we do think that they don't justify wholesale moral condemnation of political writing. And here we think it's important to distinctions between violence against property and violence against persons. So we agree with some accounts in the, pro in the literature that violence against persons, especially violence against private individuals, we think violence against police can be different because sometimes violence against police is justified as a form of self-defense. But violence against private individuals in order to communicate anger, even justified anger, is, in, is impermissible. However, the picture is different with regard to violence against property. So here, we don't think there should be a complete ban against damaging state property. A state, even if it is a collective moral agent, is not an individual that is worthy of respect that should be protected for being used as a mean. Damaging state property is worrying only in the sense that it imposes indirect harm on citizens who make use of that property, so enjoying the protection by working police cars and so on and so forth. These citizens will now incur indirect costs of replacing the damaged property, but concern about the ind indirect impact on citizens can be trumped by the minority's demand to express their anger for the exclusion from equal access to these very same services. Damaging private property can be more problematic, but here too there are some circumstances uh, where some forms of violence are justified. So think, for example, about a typical form of, of violence against private property during the race riots in the US in the 60s. So rioters targeted privately owned cafes, restaurants, cin cinemas, and amusement parks that were de facto practi practicing uh, racial segregation. Um, so we think that private individuals who support and practice segregation or other forms of social exclusion cannot really argue that they are being treated as means to an end when their behavior is met with a justified, angry response. After all, it is that very behavior, their behavior, the immorally, the morally wrong behavior, that instigated the anger and resentment, so they can be expected to bear the consequences of those actions. So there are forms of even uh, violence against private property 
that can be permissible. Okay, so I'll quickly conclude. So we developed into a paper a qualified defensive political writing that identifies two types of right reasons and right intentions that can change our moral assessment of political writers. In the first case, the writers might not be directly intending to protect, protest against injustice, but she is aware that her actions contribute to morally defensible civil disobedience. And for that reason, we can change our, that may change our moral assessment of her. In the second case, even if the, uh, the, the writer's actions have an important community care element in of themselves, connecting as a concerns the gravity of the injustice. And in both these cases, we think society can have a reason to respond to writing a different way that it responds to other forms of collective violence. Thank you. Very good. Yes, we have two hands. So uh, I thought we were here just to change this. Okay, and uh, yep, and just say your name. Okay. Uh, Faisal. Um, so I'm looking at the question. So there's been a long history of such shows. Recently, we've been reading uh, E.P. Thompson's history of English work and class, mm -hmm. where he has this phrase of um, bargaining by the riot. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's yeah. often in the name of justice, people are often trapped. Uh, faces and, and then trying to set up the brain that they should for a just price. Yeah. So, two questions I had were um, do you think one could just plug in just for traditional just war criteria mm -hmm. uh, and to, to give us guidance as to when it's permissible? So, the last resort and portion of the process of success, or is it a way anything different? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the other one had on one anger. So I wonder whether it was uniquely true of uh, rioting that you needed to riot to express anger. Because it seems to me, uh, I hope not, because there are many ways I can be angry or express that without rioting. So, <clears throat> and I was thinking about those who campaign actively for social justice, people from uh, Gandhi and America, they uh, criticise things like rioting. So couldn't one say that there are other ways of expressing Thanks. It's a nice reference to Thompson. It's been I, one of the texts I read as a first year undergraduate student. I remember E.P. Thompson, cover to cover. And um, I need to go back to it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, thanks for that. I, I'll go back to it because I didn't. Uh, uh, yeah, I think you're right. It's a, it's a good example. About traditional just war criteria. Yes, so uh, this is um, a. I, we do that in the paper actually, the section of violence uses a just work criteria. Not all of them, so the, the right authority doesn't really have a relevance here. But, um, and of course, the way that the just war uh, theory... Um, it's interesting, I think this is probably the, the most sophisticated analysis of violence that I've found, really, just war theory. There isn't much out there uh, except for just war theory. If you think about the rules of domestic violence, the, I, I would, if, if, if someone has references, that would be uh, nice because uh, the, there is a lot of this. I think just what theory gives us the best one. The content would be different, of course, because just what theory deals with the permissibility of right of killing or, or killing on a kind of a, 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 also a, of a large kind of a scale. And therefore, what you would be required to be, when you would be allowed to use that, would be different. But the kind of the right intention and so on, of course, is similar. Can I say something quick on that? Yeah. Well, very quick because we have six more uh, contributions. But for far ahead. So it seems like there would be a structural similarity. I mean, it's, it's true for whether you use the police. Uh, you want to. Yeah. Have, um, oh, should we do something else first? Last maybe. Is maybe. this going to work? No. Uh, this is, you know, a sledgehammer to cut portion out. You can write for authority. If people are going to start rioting, that means the police might come around to my estate and assault me. I think. Well, yes, you have the right to do. Yeah, so, so maybe that's the case. I think it's interesting that they develop a place specifically to war, and there's not much thinking about the specific case of violence outside the war criteria, right? So I think that's just uh, an interesting. There was a little bit of literature on it in, in, in the 70s, you know, on a, uh, 
compliance by the law. So I think you're right that it would be useful, but we need to adjust it to our to, to that. The other question about the violence, so um, I don't know, I mean, I associate uh, violence with anger, so I was not persuaded by the other examples, there are other ways of expressing anger, and perhaps, perhaps they are, but not to the same extent, not to the same urgency, not to the same level. But maybe we can, I don't know, have a, a respectful conversation, not have a conversation about it later in this way, because I, I think it's these correlations between two quite connected. Yeah. Okay, we have, as I said, six more, so that's under two minutes each. Okay, uh, I'll be so quick. we all will be quick, yeah? So Saba is the next. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll make it quick. So you ruled out at the end rioting with the purpose of targeting individuals and killing yeah. them in order to bring about political change. Yeah. But you do allow uh, destruction of state property. Yeah. But there's one case that you haven't discussed, which is killing individuals as a side effect of targeting state property. Yeah. And at first, this might seem to be out of bounds, but then consider that when you with respect to the application of the just work criteria, yeah. that we would presumably be permitted to do so in order to prevent an invading state from mm -hmm. establish, re establishing segregation in the US. Mm -hmm. So, why that is, we'd be, we'd be permitted to target enemy installations that kill mm -hmm. civilians as a side effect. Mm -hmm. So, why isn't it that rioters are permitted to do the same yeah. in order to overturn segregation? That is, Target state property and kill civilians as a side effect rather than as an mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, So, my answer would actually be that um, I, um, I have two responses to that. One of them is that I don't, I don't buy the doctrine of uh, double effect. So, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't buy that story. So, I, I have a problem with that. That's the way that usually just war just theory justifies, dies against individuals. I just don't think that story works. So then perhaps there are circumstances where uh, I'm uh, right, there are circumstances that in order to prevent a huge moral wrong, you are allowed to commit a small moral wrong, such as killing, and perhaps there will be cases where that would have to fit into the story. The other, the other uh, answer I want to give, and this is um, something that when I spoke with Philippe over uh, the lunch break, he also said something similar like that, that I think we need to have pretty uh, clear rules about what's going on here. And I think in the case of political rights, you want to have rules about that are simple to understand, and that you don't have, you know, you're you kind of you're holding the stone in your hand, you're kind of thinking, wait a minute, I need to open the book rules and see what I'm allowed to do, not allowed to do. I want to have pretty simple, straightforward rules. I want to have the rules that say, don't uh, 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 violate the right to life of private individuals. That's something pretty straightforward and easy to follow. If I start giving modifications to that, I just don't know how much it can be useful. Uh, in, so that's kind of the the point that we give to that. Philip? So, with civil disobedience or with political rising, I must say I prefer to characterize them in a way that doesn't imply that they're good political rising or good civil disobedience. Okay. So I'm not out, I'm quite happy to give the title of civil disobedience to forms of action that I deeply disapprove of. Mm -hmm. you know, might be civil disobedience against immigration yep. policies, yep. but they're yep. actually, you know, generous immigration mm -hmm. policies or something. And similarly, political rioting, I mean, mm -hmm. I think there can be pretty bad political rioting. So, mm -hmm. putting in conditions like no violence, targeting persons, and mm -hmm. so on, that sounds like you're defining good political rioting rather than right. That's just background. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a question. Mm -hmm. I distrust, because partly it mixes up the good and the, you know, just what is right and what's good right. I just was going to the reasons of the, or even the intentions of the agents, because they're so hard to read, mm -hmm. given there isn't a corporate structure of any mm -hmm. kind, usually in these cases. Mm -hmm. And it's much better to go to how do they regard, uh, how do they regard the courts? So, for example, people practicing civil disobedience traditionally accept the authority of the courts. And that marks a clear distinction from what used to be called resistance or revolution mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. regime change mm -hmm. or whatever. Now, I think that the political rising, even if it's called political, it's presumably motivated politically, uh, people, mm -hmm. though they may go somewhat berserk or whatever, the courts mm -hmm. would recognize mm -hmm. that, they wouldn't do it unless they thought these were bloody awful police mm -hmm. or terrible mm -hmm. rules or laws or whatever. Uh, one, the big question for me is whether or not they would accept the authority of the courts. I mean, say, these are awful laws, you know, but we... Yep. Can't you see they're awful laws, yep. so to speak, yep. rather than saying, this whole system should be overthrown in yeah. favor of some uh, alternative system. 
And that brings political writing and civil disobedience not just together, they're on a spectrum. Now they'll be different phenomenologically in terms of the actual intentions, etc. But I prefer to group them, not to find them in terms of the values, to find them in terms of laws accepted or not, contrast with resistance, and then see them as being on a spectrum with differences mm -hmm. between them of, of an orthogonal kind. Yeah. It's a good point. I mean, I, 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 I agree with you that I don't think that the phenomenon of itself is, is, is defined in light of the content of the, what you are arguing for. So you can have good and bad forms of civil disobedience in the sense that they are fighting for good or bad causes. I think that, we, that my response to that would be that I think that um, civil disobedience is justified only if it is in the service of good causes. So if you uh, engage in civil disobedience against, say, migrants' rights, and I would say you're just doing something that's morally wrong, and the same as political writing. So I think that that does come into the, the more assessment of these individuals. Um, and on things we can agree, we might say some things that, you know, we, I can say that it is a reasonable view that I disagree with, that of course will change it. Now about uh, courts, so um, I think that the, uh, the acceptance of punishment is really one of the things that marks the difference between writing and civil disobedience. And civil disobedience, at least in some account, has the obligation to accept the authority of the law. So there's kind of really Rather, rather convoluted arguments of why is it that they have to accept the authority of their own and political writers I can take as part of the definition that they do not, that they try or say, what does it mean to accept the authority of their own? So, of course, they accept punishment when people are forced to accept punishment, they will try to avoid punishment if they can. They do not submit to punishment the way the civil disability you know, break in and call the police and ask them, come and arrest me, I've committed an offense, right? They don't have that quality. <coughs> And I think that, in my view, the cases that we are dealing with, the cases of severe injustice, are cases where, indeed, we can't have expectations of them to accept the authority of the law. So, for example, when you are fighting against police brutality or the way the police treats individual members of your community, I don't see why you then have an obligation towards police to accept the authority of the law. The only argument can be an instrumental argument, kind of, in a forward-looking sense, I demonstrate to you that I'm willing to cooperate with you in the future, but I don't know that we have an obligation to people who oppress us in a severe way to then demonstrate to them that we are actually willing to cooperate with them. It just seems like that the burden is on the oppressor rather than the oppressed. So I think that actually we are dealing here with cases where the law does, does begin to, the, this, the authority begins to disentangle. And then I, I, I'm not persuaded that we have that, that obligation to accept the authority of the law. So I would actually put writing closer to the end of the resistance than to the civil disobedience side. But sometimes resistance, sometimes I think the oppressor needs to understand that he's being resisted in order to, uh, to respond. I think that the, the Canada report, the events of the 60s, are very interestingly um, you know, display that kind of uh, sequence of events. Um, I don't think we're going to get through all our questions here, but I think you are next. Do you have a question? No? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you have, yeah. Uh, thank you very uh, interesting and uh, the paper. Uh, I don't think any of the examples you give of riots actually fit your criteria mm -hmm. for what we count as a uh, just uh, morally defensible riot. Mm -hmm. uh, take the American cases you cite, the uh, racial riots in mm -hmm. the 1960s. Mm -hmm. They all involve massive looting of stores. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody involved was a looter, but there was massive looting. Um, the uh, targets of the property violence were not segregated. These were riots all in the north, which did not have uh, danger or even in de facto segregation. In fact, most of the stores were uh, uh, mainly African American clientele. Uh, the the, uh, uh, the um, violence against them was justified on the grounds that these uh, the owners were exploiting the local population, not that there was any segregation involved. Uh, but uh, but more generally, it's not. I don't think it's a um, an accident that uh, in most cases, um, uh, in practically all cases that I can think of, uh, your criteria aren't met. And the reason is quite simple. Um, unless human beings are highly trained and highly disciplined, and even if they are highly trained and highly disciplined in a structured situation, it's very easy for violence to get out of hand. Mm -hmm. okay? People just go overboard. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason is the anger problem, because violence is engaged in by people who are angry, and if the, unless there is a structure they're operating in which keeps that anger very tightly controlled, it, very, it gets out of hand right away. Uh, and this is exactly the situation in rioting. There is no structure. To, you have a lot of angry human beings who don't have any organizational structure.
to keep them in line. And so you get things like looting in the LA riots, for example, yep. uh, in response to the Rodney King episode. There were particularly innocent people on the street who had the hell beat mad at them. Uh, this kind of thing typically happens in Great. riots. So I think you underestimate the moral risk involved with the riots. And the result is you have kind of rosy colored glasses mm -hmm. through which you're looking at a lot of these riots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. you're, you're still rosy colored glasses, and I'm not going to have to answer that in about one minute because unfortunately we're out of time. I have really strict instructions to finish. Yeah, I'd love to hear the other questions. questions. Okay. okay, so I'll, be, I'll try to be very quick yeah. about this. Okay, so I don't think I agree with you on the portrayal of the race riots in the 60s. Maybe I'm rosy colored by, uh, rosy eyed by reading the Kerner report, which some people argue was rosy eyed, but that's kind of, and you know, some says like Button's book, uh, book on the black violence, which I think portray a different uh, argument than what you... I don't know enough yet. Uh, we haven't done research about current riots yet. So I disagree with you on the facts, but maybe we can have a conversation about it later. Even in the fact that you present are correct, and you can say what I'm providing is a manual for collective violence. You might say, okay, we have so much work on what to do with war. Why don't we have any work on what to do with domestic violence? And I'm giving a manual for people to say, okay, if we are engaging with it, how can we direct the troops? I'm giving you some manual. Well, I would like, uh, I think I have to stop, unfortunately. Uh, I don't really like doing this, but I've, I'm not in my home territory here, so I've been told I have to cut things off. But I know there was a question here, 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 and here, so I just encourage you to uh, talk to Avia during uh, the coffee break and okay. maybe afterwards. Love to hear so the question. Thank you very much. Thank you.